There's a great American hero we all look up to. When the times are hard and chips are down, he knows just what to do. Now a cowboy's got a set of rules that he lives by day to day. And if you ask for his advice, he'll more than likely say. If it's a fence, mend it. If it's a dollar bill, spend it. Before it burns a hole down in them jeans. If it's a load, truck it. If it's a punch, duck it. If she's a lady, treat her like a queen. That's cowboy logic. Every cowboy's got it. It's in the way he lives his life and the songs he sings. That's cowboy logic. Every cowboy's got it. He's got a simple solution for just about anything. If it's a job, do it. Put your back into it. Cause a little bit of dirt's gonna wash off and rain. If it's a horse, ride it. If it hurts, hide it. Dust yourself off and get back on again. That's cowboy logic. Every cowboy's got it. It's in the way he lives his life and the songs he sings. That's cowboy logic. Every cowboy's got it. He's got a simple solution for just about anything. An old cowboy and a young buckaroo were working, riding fence. The old hand was testing the kid on his skills and his common sense. He said, son, if you've seen three men in a pickup, dressed alike from boots to hat, could you tell which one was the real cowboy just from where he sat? The kid scratched his head a while and then he said, Well, there just ain't no way to know. The old hand grinned and then he said, Kid, you still got a ways to go. The real cowboy is the one in the middle. He ain't there just by fate. Because first, he don't have to drive. And then, he don't have to mess with the gate. That's cowboy logic. Every cowboy's got it. It's in the way he lives his life and the songs he sings. That's cowboy logic. Every cowboy's got it. He's got a simple solution for just about anything. He's got a simple solution for just about anything. Welcome to Eclectic American Roots, our weekly guide to roots music in all its many flavors. Since starting to hunker in our bunker, we've presented eight two-hour broadcasts, including a Western Swing episode, one on Sun Records, and yet another covering all the renowned blues harp players. We even did a show on the tiki culture and exotica music. One entire Eclectic American Roots show was focused on the life of Graham Parsons and another on the old Town Hall Party TV show from the 50s. The Ladies of Rockabilly may have been our most popular broadcast, but when you see what is coming up in the next several weeks, well, you won't want to miss a thing. So go to YouTube and check out our channel, Stellar Jacks, and subscribe today. Our edited episodes are usually on YouTube just a couple days after they air. Make a note, Stellar Jacks channel on YouTube. And please remember, use the tip jar at StellarJacks.com. It's the only source of income our musicians have while they are sequestered indefinitely. Things may have opened up for most businesses, but live concerts are still a long way off. 
Today we present the roots of the singing cowboy. So saddle up, buckaroos, because we're going to take you to some interesting places. Our guests today are the great Tom Russell, sequestering in Switzerland. Junie Fisher joins us from Nashville, and Rex Allen Jr. checks in from out west in Nevada. We wouldn't dream of doing a show about singing cowboys without the riders in the sky. Ranger Doug and Too Slim are joining us to share what is happening out there on the strange range. Plus, Ranger Doug narrates our tribute to the singing cowboys of the silver screen. You baby boomers out there will revel in the many references to 40s and 50s westerns on TV and on the big screen. So get ready to ride the musical trail down Melody Lane as we explore the roots of the singing cowboy. I said goodbye to my mother, to my father, all the other friends I knew I headed west. Seek my fortune Chase the foolish dream that has no end Dave Stamey is often called the Charlie Russell of American music, and there's a good reason. Charles M. Russell was a gifted artist who painted some 2,000 canvases of cowboys, Indians, and the American West, with resonance and with careful detail. Down the other side To a land So burn and twisted To a country Barren as the moon I hope to find The Eldorado All I found were these hollow winds that blow Stamey does a similar thing, only as a storyteller and musician. His original songs like Come Ride With Me, A Romantic Appeal to a Life on Horseback, and the Vaquero song, recalling California's Rancho era, are very compelling. He pulls inspiration from his personal life and other more esoteric sources. Stamey is no beer drinking, pickup riding, bro country dude. He is a functioning cowboy, a rancher, mule packer, and wrangler, which is where most of his material comes from. His many albums have titles like Buckaroo Guy, Old Close Friends, and Campfire Waltz. Stamey knows that the present day cowboy is an endangered species, and he captures that spirit in his songs, where some things change constantly and others never change in any way. When I saw St. Peter sitting at the bar The devil was right there by his side They were drinking beer and rolling dice for my soul To see which direction I'd slide The Western Music Association has voted Stamey Entertainer of the Year and Male Performer of the Year seven times and Songwriter of the Year only five times. He's received the Will Rogers Award from the Academy of Western Artists, and in 2016, Dave was inducted into the Western Music Hall of Fame. For all these reasons and more, we've asked Dave to be our host for this very special presentation, The Roots of the Singing Cowboy. Purgatory Cantina It's an outcast clientele the Purgatory Cantina Somewhere twixt heaven and hell All right, we're going to start off this chariot with uh, two of my two of my heroes. They've been my heroes since I was a little bitty kid. I've listened to them. Yeah. And uh, they are the the premier premier purveyors of classic classic western music. Riders in the sky we have we have Ranger Doug and my friend Too Slim. Wahoo, wahoo, wahoo. Give me those wide open spaces. Well, I'm just like a prairie flower, growing wilder every hour. Give me a moon, a prairie moon. Give me a gal that's true. Let me wahoo, wahoo, wahoo. Hi, guys. Hey, hey, hey. Big, big western howdy day. <laughs> So let's 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 start at the beginning. What uh, when did you when did you begin this adventure? Can I can I lower my mask here? Oh, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, uh, just make sure you're six feet away from me. That's all. Yeah, I'm six feet. Yeah, I'm six miles away from everybody right now. <laughs> miles away from you. So I'm, so I'm good. <laughs> Go ahead, Ranger Doug. How'd you get started with Riders in the Sky? Well, a uh, little friend of mine uh, got sick, and she canceled the date. 
and she asked if I would play it for her. I'd been doing some solo cowboy work around and singing some cowboy songs with the band, but I thought I'd call up my buddy Too Slim, who was simply Fred in those days, yes. and say, well, would you like to play some Western music tonight? Hair Harry's Frankenstein, November 11th, 1977. Oh, my. He said, well, can I play my my upright bass? And I said, you have to play your upright bass. He said, okay, but I don't have a hat. I said, well, I've got a hat. So I gave him a hat. He brought his bass. <laughs> and another guy called Wendy Bill Collins, and the three of us uh, began this glorious adventure that old November evening. My goodness. And so you, you, you didn't have to be dragged kicking and screaming too slim. You, you went into this willingly. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was playing with the, some different bands around town with, uh, I've been working with Dickie Lee on the road and, uh, playing electric country music. And, and I played, uh, in bluegrass with Ranger Doug back when he was deputy. Doug. And, um, <laughs> but he, he was bringing, he was always wearing a cowboy hat to these bluegrass shows. And, and then when he had a solo number, he'd, uh, he'd uh, stand up there and do a Bob Nolan song, do a, you know, Song of the Prairie or, or some uh, Lord Made the Cowboy Happy or something. And I was like, where did that song come from? <laughs> I thought I knew a lot of songs. And he said, this guy Bob Nolan wrote it, you know, Cool Water and Tumble Tumble. I said, did he write any more? Yeah, like 1,200. So <laughs> <laughs> I said, I got to check this. And, and plus, I remember it from when I was a kid. I had a cowboy hero when, when I was a kid. So and I listened to a lot of Western music when I was a child. So um, it, it was just real natural to me. Close to your heart even before you started this thing. Oh, very much so. Um, partly due to my uh, uncles. I had two uncles that played guitar and sang and my mother was a good singer although she preferred classical music yeah. and then we lived in uh, southern california when i was a kid when my dad was in the navy and we uh you know they had all they had town hall party and doy odell western varieties and all those shows and the knott's berry farm had live music oh, so yeah. I think when he was 19 or 20 years old <laughs> and it just this stuck with me i just loved it Oh, wonderful. You you know how important the entertainment factor is. Is there not the desire to preserve and honor this music then? That's, is that, that sort of inherent in what you guys do, would you say? Sure is. That's been our mission from the start, just to do it in a funny way. And and make it entertaining, but, but God knows not make fun of it. The lyrics and the music, it was so interesting and complex to play. And to do it right, we figured if we concentrated on doing the music right that the comedy would follow but if you don't if you're just doing you know not good versions of the music and doing comedy it's, it's just a lame sort of college act you know it's, it doesn't have legs to it so we knew that the music was the heart and soul of it well I, I have to congratulate you because you've always been while you've been entertaining and amusing and fun you've never been campy it was it shows it, it your your, yeah. your the integrity comes through it absolutely comes through how many dates? Yeah. How many dates before before the Sargasso Sea descended upon us of the pandemic? Uh, how many dates a year would you be doing likely? Well, if you count Grand Ole Opry shows, statistically, it's about 180. Oh my goodness! And, and we should mention that too. You are the only Western act that I am aware of actually uh, that are that is a member of the Grand Ole Opry. That's true. I don't true. know of any other Western yeah. acts that were ever members of the Grand Ole. Opry. No, the Willis Brothers are about the closest. They dress Western, but they sing country. Yeah, exactly. The era of the music that you guys celebrate is is such a classic era with some wonderful wonderful songwriters. People like Billy Hill and of course Bob Nolan, Buddy De Silva, even. Cole Porter, you can throw him in there because of uh, Don't Fence Me In and so forth. Um, how important is it to you to make certain that some of these great old obscure songs don't get lost? We keep digging them up, don't we, Slim? Yeah, there's still, there's so many great songs. And we have arrangements and we've done through the years, we've, we've, we've gone through a lot of songs. I mean, we've made 40 albums or something, but there's still tons more. Not only the, from the folk tradition, but from the, you got to remember that that music in the '40s that was popular music. I mean, that was selling big records. They were number one. Yeah, Crosby. 
at all those Western records. Yeah, yeah. And, and so my question to you is, and, and of course, Doug, you're known you're known as a as a historian, and you were a historian even before you started this adventure. But uh, uh, and your your book, of course, is is a, a, a tremendous. It's it's like a master's thesis on cowboy singers on steroids, uh, uh-huh. singing in the saddle. A brilliant book. A brilliant book. So um, yeah, and there we have it. Uh, um, so Available what's... now at Two Sons Mercantile. <laughs> <laughs> so, how are we still digging up these songs? Where do you find them? Well, I have. Um, there's, a of... there's a lot of weird stuff on YouTube these days, and I have a friend, Dave Barnes, in England, who has that label. I'm sure you know of it, called the British Academy of Country Music. Mm-hmm. Uh, where he gets his stuff, I'll never know, but he has some great things. And, and we put them out on our uh, Sirius XM show, Side Meat and I have uh, called Classic Cowboy Corral. And we always stick with the old stuff and uh, play a lot of that stuff on there. So we're hearing new old tunes all the time. He has hundreds of records by the most obscure people. He's introduced me to a group called the Hillbillies, which was an English cowboy act of the 30s but anyway it's the british academy of country music b-a-c-m okay dot com look into that. We'll look yeah. into that. oh you you'll be delighted to see what he's got wonderful wonderful well what's what's next for you guys uh, once once we get rolling again who knows <laughs> <laughs> we're opening hoping the grand Ole opry will begin to let half audiences in there or something speak a little bit about about adventures that you've had in meeting some of your heroes well uh, i guess the best one was getting to play with roy rogers on the hee-haw oh my uh, that was a thrill i have a picture of that up in my office as you it's, as uh, you should oh my we did, we did a couple of shows with roy we uh we did, we did a benefit did a benefit and he used to come out and see us and uh when we played out there in victorville and it was like Walking into a movie or something, when I saw, I always say that one of the highlights of my life, absolute showbiz highlight, is when I walked into a room and Roy Rogers knew who I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my, I walked in and said, oh, two slims here. Oh my God. <laughs> my name. He uh, turned to us just as the film was about to start and said, wonder what Gene's doing today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my but I, I was lucky in my research days there at the country music hall of fame i got to meet a lot of those guys and, and know them fairly well johnny bond and ray whitley and jimmy wakeley and eddie dean and uh, monty hale just uh, a lot of the guys who i wrote about in that book i actually got to meet and know i never met bob nolan but i talked with him on the phone and uh lloyd perryman i met him it's just it's been a heck of a Heck of a ride. Gene Autry, we've met Gene Autry several times. Oh, sure. When we did that TV show, uh, he came down to visit us there in 1991, walked in with his entourage. You know, it was like the president walking in and everybody calling him Mr. Autry this and Mr. Autry that. It was really quite a pageant, but he was very gracious and, and uh, very kind to us. Very sweet to be back in the saddle again. Yeah. Well, I think most of, most of those those figures in uh, in our conjoined history were always pretty kind and pretty gracious. Comes with the territory, I think. I, I believe you're right. You, you have written, uh, both of you have written um, original music, uh, quite a bit of it. And when you when you write your own stuff like that, are you always you're always hearkening back to the uh, to the classics and 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 those who have gone before us? Foremost in my mind is probably writing a song that can have harmony because I'm hearing that in my head when I'm writing it. And then I concentrate a lot on the lyrics because the, the guys who shaped what I do, like Bob Nolan and Tim Spencer, were such poets. You know, it was not just this buck and bronco and that stampede, you know, it yeah. was just the beauty and majesty of the West. How about you, Slim? Uh, well, I don't know what I think about. I think about what I can deliver in a humorous way a lot because that's a lot of my job is to mm. be the funny guy so I, I like to if i'm going to do a funny song i like to uh, you know do a parody or something that uh that stands up that i can do night after night and still enjoy interested in finding uh finding out what uh uh how well you guys 
relate to all ages, all the, the youngsters and, and the oldsters as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's why we're here 42 years later, is that we've, uh, we've, we've always had a, we, when we first started and then when we were playing beer joints and we had sort of an R-rated act, it was, uh, we were playing for people our age. And, and, and then they started to bring their kids. And so the R-rated part of the show had to sort of, <laughs> I had to change because we had little <laughs> kids dressing like cowboys sitting up in the front row. It's like you can't do sheep jokes and yeah. drug jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Blue material. Yeah, yeah, right. So, and then it was just a, such a natural thing to to develop a, a kids friendly act because that's what appeals to the to the child in me. God knows the the feel why I loved Western music when I was a kid. Yeah, and, you know, it's the feel of it. It's the, the the rhythm, the sense of fun and adventure to it, and and uh, and in a band setting, I think uh, that that just really communicates. So we've had we've had stories like like people come up after the show and say, you know, you're my son and my father's favorite band. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a guy there's 80 and a, and a grandson, you know, who's 10, and they love it. They're, they're both, you know, bonding over this thing. That's wonderful. That, that's just as about as cool as it gets yeah. for me. Well, it's it stood you in good stead. I mean, all the way from beer joints to the Grammys. So, uh, yeah, as they say in Australia, good on you. Garnering different demographic and a wide audience from little kids to old people. It wasn't part of some master plan. It's just who we are. Uh, reflected on stage. I think people respond to that. They respond, we're having a great time on stage. And people come and they, they, they sense that. You know, we often hear that, man, you guys look like you're having so much fun. Is, is, is that an act? You know, how can you do that night after night? And it's still, and it's, but it's fr it feels fresh. Okay. How, how often in the early days did you bomb? We never bombed. The audience bombed. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so very much for being a part of this. And um, Yeah, great to see you again, too. Great to see you, Dave. I wish I could hear you sing and play one of these days. It's always such a treat. Well, one of these days, one of these days, I hope to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mighty fine and a great big western howdy. This is Ranger Doug with Riders in the Sky. The singing cowboy is an icon in America with names like Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, and Tex Ritter, the most recognizable. This bunch has become famous through their movies and television shows, but before they came along, there was the original singing cowboy. The notion of the singing cowboy was established way back in 1925 when Carl T. Sprague from Texas recorded the first cowboy song, When the Work's All Done This Fall. A year later, a nationally broadcast radio show aired cowboy songs. This was the heart of the Roaring Twenties, and the new medium of radio began exposing Americans to this compelling campfire music. America's first radio singing cowboy to broadcast nationally began his career on an NBC station in New York in 1926. John I. White was a Washington, D.C. singer who fell in love with cowboy music and called himself the Lonesome Cowboy. Cowboy songs were a cultural phenomenon that held the nation's attention during the Great Depression and beyond. The music spoke of traditional values and hard work paying off, giving hope to the hopeless during the economic downturn. The full popularity of the singing cowboy would not be realized until talkies were created in Hollywood, where the image of the cowboy became a romanticized view of the West and gave the public confidence during the difficult times of the Great Depression. Silent Western movies had been entertaining the American public for over 25 years, but in early 1929, sound came to Westerns with the release of a film called In Old Arizona. And shortly after that, the singing cowboy was born. Ken Maynard, a master horseman, trick rider, and silent film star added his talents as musician and singer in the 1929 release, The Wagon Master, 
For his first singing cowboy role, Maynard chose to sing traditional cowboy songs, The Lone Star Trail and The Cowboy's Lament. But Maynard's greatest contribution to the singing cowboy movies was his introduction of a radio and recording artist named Gene Autry to the silver screen when he appeared in Maynard's picture in Old Santa Fe in 1934. Autry's recording of that silver-haired daddy of mine had been the first million-selling record on radio a couple of years prior. In a vine-covered shack in the mountain, bravely fighting the bad of time, is a dear one who's weathered life's sorrow, is that silver-haired daddy of mine. Old westerns and cowboy music owned the box office for the next two decades, from the 1930s to the middle 1950s, beginning with Autry's film Tumbling Tumbleweeds. Films starring singing cowboys such as Gene Autry, Tex Ritter, and Roy Rogers were prolific, featuring the actors adorned in big hats, well-tailored western shirts, and cowboy boots. Their gun rigs were phenomenal, and their horses were superb. Their humorous sidekick deserved mention as well. Beyond the big screen, each of these actors had a thriving musical career and were very successful in producing hit records like Back in the Saddle Again, High Noon, and Happy Trails to You. Hollywood's adaptation of The Singing Cowboy really romanticized the image of the West. The Hollywood cowboy was no longer a tattered drover sitting around a campfire with a harmonica. Singing cowboys welcomed female performers such as Patsy Montana, too. She entered the scene in the 1930s with the help of longtime friend Gene Autry and sang songs about confident, independent women, an idea that was very forward-thinking at the time. She was the feminine counterpart to Gene Autry's cowboy hero. One important contribution to the singing cowboy genre was made by Herb Jeffries, a black jazz vocalist who determined that the black youth of America needed a cowboy hero as well. He was given the go-ahead to star in a series of all-black singing cowboy movies. And he starred in five films from 1936 to 39, which include titles like Harlem Rides the Range, Two Gun Men from Harlem, and The Bronze Buckaroo. Dorothy Page was the only singing cowgirl to be given a starring role. A talented actress who could sing, rope, ride, and shoot in three films, which were released in 1939, Ride em, Cowgirl, The Singing Cowgirl, and water wrestlers. Republic Studios gave the Sons of the Pioneers lead singer his first starring role and gave him a new name, Roy Rogers, in Under Western Stars in 1938, when they replaced Gene Autry over contract disputes. Autry continued as the reigning singing cowboy of the 1930s, but Roy Rogers became the king of the cowboys in the 40s. He'd continue to make an average of eight movies a year until Pals of the Golden West in 1951. Singing cowboys Tex Ritter, Jimmy Wakeley, Eddie Dean, Monty Hale, Ken Curtis joined Gene Autry and Roy Rogers in the last decade of the musical West. The last of the silver screen cowboys began his career with the Arizona Cowboy in 1950. Rex Allen, like many of his predecessors, came to Hollywood from a radio and recording career. In his 19th film, Phantom Stallion was released in 1954. The era of the singing cowboy western movies had finally come to an end. Roy Rogers and Gene Autry now entered the new medium of television. Roy Rogers and Dale Evans and Gene Autry went on to star in The Gene Autry Show and The Roy Rogers Show, respectively, but the series runs ended by the close of the 1950s and the singing cowboy gradually ceased to exist in popular culture, except as an exercise in nostalgia. But fear not, the genre has returned with the creation of a cowboy singing group calling themselves Riders in the Sky. Singers, musicians, songwriters, Ranger Doug, Too Slim, Woody Paul, and Joey the Cowpoke King excel at recapturing the spirit of the old Republic studio films, often with tongue-in-cheek humor that plays well to baby boomers, brought up on a steady diet of singing cowboys. Dave Stamian troops and the singing cowboys and uh, I'm coming to you from the uh, Emmental Valley in Switzerland. If I look out my window talking about cowboys, boy, I see horses, alpacas for wool, 
and a lot of Simmental cattle and, uh, and barns built in the 1700s. So I kind of feel like uh, I'm connected to you guys. It's good to see Dave uh, there and uh, one of the greatest of the modern singer singing cowboys and uh, one of these days we're going to do a train with Dave. But uh, I'm going to do a song, but you asked me about singing cowboys, and I grew up with it. I grew up near Hollywood. My brother Pat Russell is a great cowboy. I took up the guitar, but he had, a, and I think Dave knows Pat. Ian Tyson has written a couple of songs about my brother, <laughs> including Cowboy Pride and uh, Heartaches Are Stealing, but uh, Murphy recorded Cowboy Pride, Michael Martin Murphy. But uh, my brother Pat in the 1950s worked on dude ranches and in films with Slim Pickens and he knew Casey Tibbs, he's still active uh, as a uh, livestock contractor. He had 78s and LPs and he had, uh, of course we grew up on, uh, how can you top Marty Robbins gunfighter ballads in 1959 where El Paso was the number one song for about a year on the pop and country charts. Back, I guess, when it was country western, which it should have remained. But not only Marty, but we tend to forget Jimmy Driftwood, who wrote the Tennessee Stud, which was also getting a lot of radio play. And he also wrote the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, one of the other records that was great was Frankie Lane's uh, Hell Bent for Leather. Great record. But before that, I guess I grew up singing cowboys. Gene Autry is the obvious one, back in the saddle again. And uh, who else from that era? Oh God, there were so many of them. My, my father used to play uh, poker with Hopalong Cassidy on the backside of Hollywood Park Racetrack, but, and I've written a new song about it. But, uh, but Hoppy wasn't a fan of singing cowboys because Hoppy couldn't sing. But uh, who else did I think of? Oh, Tex Ritter. That's the bottom line for me. Tex Ritter's record, Blood on the Saddle. Tex wasn't necessarily a hard a working cowboy, but he was a folklore guy, and uh, he had that voice, creepy voice. And here's an anecdote before I do a song. I knew Otis Blackwell when I lived in Brooklyn in the 80s. Otis wrote a lot of songs for Elvis, Don't Be Cruel. He wrote All Shook Up, I guess, for Jerry Lee. Uh, now, I asked, El, I, mean, I, mean, I asked Otis one time, who was, your fa who was your inspiration? He told me Tex Ritter. He told me uh, Otis, this black guy, uh, African-American who grew up in Brooklyn, said every Saturday as a kid he'd go to the cinema and see a Tex Ritter movie, and he longed to write songs like that. So that's the way our music, the folk process, transpires and then by the 1980s you had Don Edwards and Michael Martin Murphy and Waddy Mitchell recreating for Warner Brothers cowboy music. They came to New York when I was living there and they played at the top of the uh, Empire State Building. There's a bar up there that Woody Guthrie played and they got me up on stage to sing Navajo Rug back in the uh, must have been early 1980s and then of course uh, Ian Tyson really resuscitated the cowboy song. He recorded my song, Gallo Del Cielo, on his first cowboy record in the 80s, and then we went on to write a dozen. We wrote Navajo Rug and Claude Dallas and on and on. But Ian, to me, is the biggest inspiration and a great singer. So thank you, Dave Stamey, and thanks all, all you folks for listening. I'm gonna do Tonight We Ride, which I wrote up in the Santa Barbara Hills, and uh, Stamey knows all about that country. Watch over you across the border in the year of about 16. The people of old Santa Monica, or wherever you are, Switzerland, hear Poncho riding through their dreams. He killed 17 civilians, you could hear the people scream. Blackjack Pershing on a dancing horse was waiting in the wings. Tonight we ride. Tonight we ride. We'll skin old Pancho Villa and make shafts out of his hide. Shoot his horse, Siete Lewas, and his 27 brides. Tonight we ride, boys. Tonight we ride. We rode for three long years to Black Jack Pershing, called it quits. When Jackie wasn't looking, 
I stole his fine spade bit It was tied upon a stallion So I rode away on it To the wild Chihuahuan desert So dry you couldn't spit Tonight we ride You bastards dare We'll hunt the wild Apache For the bounty on their hair They will ride me to old Zurich Climb up the whorehouse stairs Tonight we ride, Dave Too damn old to sit a horse, I'll steal the warden's car. Break my ass out of this prison, leave my teeth there in a jar. You don't need no teeth for kissing girls or smoking cheap cigars. I'll sleep with one eye open, eat God's celestial stars. Tonight we rock, hey, tonight we roll. We'll rob the Santa Monica liquor stores for the rape Posada gold. And if we drink ourselves to death, ain't that the cowboy way to go? Tonight we ride, boys. Dave Stamey, Cowboys, uh, speaking of uh, margaritas and uh, Ray Posada Gold, there you go. It's TomRussellArt.com. God bless y'all. Hey, folks. Christopher Burkhardt here from Stellar Shows. Just wanted to take a quick break and thank some of the people who have been donating money to our show today. We've got some high rollers that think enough about these musicians that they want to help support them, each of which stepped out of their comfort zone and kicked a whole lot of money into our tip jar. Whether you donate five, ten, or a hundred dollars, these musicians are going to get a share of it, and we appreciate your efforts. The tip jar, by the way, is at stellarjacks.com. Please go there anytime during the show and make a donation. We're about to see a nice video collage coming up of singing cowboys so we can get back to the music portion of the show that was tom russell we just saw all the way from switzerland doing my favorite song tonight we ride so while you continue to hunker in your bunker let's get on with the show I forgot the words for a minute there. I got my tongue tied around my eye teeth, couldn't see what I was saying. <laughs> Here's Roy Rogers. There was the boy in Arkansas who couldn't listen to his mom when she told him that he should go to school. He'd sneak away in the afternoon, take a little walk, and pretty soon you'd find him at the local auction barn. Each time he'd listen patiently, and pretty soon he began to see how the auctioneer could talk so rapidly. He said, oh my, it's do or die, I've got to learn that auction cry, gotta make my mark and be an auctioneer. $25 bid now, $30, 30 with they give me 30 make it 30 beat him on with $30, who'll give me 30 who'll make a $30 bid? $30 bid now, 35 with they give me 35 make it 35 bid 35 who will bid a $35 bid? As time went on, he did his best, and all could see he didn't jest, he practiced calling bids both night and day. His dad would find him on the farm, just working up an awful storm, trying to imitate that auctioneer. Now people came from miles around just to hear him make that rhythmic sound and fill their hearts with such a happy cheer. Now he's the best in all the land, let's pause and give that man a hand, cause he's the best hillbilly auctioneer. $35 bid now, $40, $40, will they give me 40 make it 40 beat him up with $40, who'll give me 40 who'll make a $40 bid? $40 bid now, $45, will they give me 45 make it 45 bid, 45 who will bid a $45 bid? $45 bid now, $50, $50, will they give me 50 make it $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $
fifty dollar bid now, fifty five. Will you give me fifty five? Make it fifty five. Bid a fifty five. Sold to the man out there in a straw hat for fifty five bucks. Happy trails to Yeah. I got spurs that jingle, jangle, jingle As I go riding merrily along And they sing, oh, ain't you glad you're single And that song ain't so very far from wrong Oh, Nellie Bell, oh, Nellie Bell, oh, Nellie Bell, Nellie Bell There's one thing I can figure, she got tired of chasing Trigger I got spurs, I got spurs, I got spurs, I got spurs. As I go I was born to be a cowboy, and I will be till I die. As I walked out in the streets of Laredo, as I walked out in Laredo one day, I spied a young cowboy wrapped up in white linen. Wrapped up in a white linen and cold as the clay. I see by your outfit that you are a cowboy. These words he did say as I boldly step by. Come sit down beside me, hear my sad story. Got shot in the breast, and I know I must die. Listen to that rhythm of the rain, reeling, rocking rhythm of the rain. You've heard that old bazooka and the king of jazz, but have you felt the tickle that this rain's rhythm has? Dancing to the rhythm of the rain. Reeling, rocking rhythm you can't change Grandpa burned his crutches and won't stay at home Since this rural rhythm has got in his bones And he's dancing to the rhythm Dancing to the rhythm Dancing to the rhythm of the range Oh, listen to that rhythm of the range Rootin' tootin' rhythm of the range You've heard the cowhand's music And you've heard him sing But have you seen that cowhand shoot a horse fly on the wing Shooting to the rhythm of the range Shot for shot is always fair exchange In the land of cattle, the six-gun is law And you get a medal if you shoot your mother-in-law So keep shooting to the rhythm, rootin' tootin' rhythm Shooting to the rhythm of the range Cowboys song. He's just too much. He's got a nog out with the ticket to his place. He's what you call a swinging hot thing. Singing that cow cow boogie in the strangest way. I'm coming to ya, ya, ya. Coming to you, pity, ya, ya. If you want to be a cowboy, just sing along with me. Perkadoodle, I know, perkadoodle, I'm learning cowboys, A, B, C. A, B, C, 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 A, B, C,
That's a cowboy baby. Drifting along with a tumbling tumblebee. I know when night has gone that a new world's born at dawn. A dear friend of mine that I've known for several decades and uh, one of the most talented uh, female artists, talented artist, female or otherwise, in uh, the Western music genre, my friend, Miss Junie Fisher. Hi, Junie. Hi, Dave. How are you? I'm really well. How are you? I'm drifting on the Sargasso Sea of the pandemic. Let me write that down. I'll go look it up. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are too. We're we're drifting along, and you know it is what it is. 
It, yeah, it sure is, darn it. Anyway. It's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a year. Yeah, it's it's good to be seen. Better seen than viewed. <laughs> As they say, when well, you are uh, uh, in a in in an industry that demands uh, that demands authenticity, um, you are uh, you are certainly that. And uh, I'd like to I'd like to start off by having you tell us a little bit about your your ranching and agricultural background and how you got started. Well, I I grew up in a farm family in Central California in Tulare County, which is. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the heart of Western music is Tulare County, California. I agree with that, <laughs> since that's where I live as well. <laughs> yeah, and that's where I grew up. Uh, Belinda Gato grew up there as well. The sons of the San Joaquin uh, are still there. Yep. And um, anyway, uh, I grew up in a farming family. My dad was a horseman. My, my grandfather farmed with horses up until the late 50s. And... Uh, um, you know, I was in 4-H and FFA and, uh, you know, bought my own first horse, started my own first horse. And then I got this great idea that I should marry a cowboy. How'd that work out? I went to live in a house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I lived on a cattle ranch and, you know, I, um, uh, was a ranch wife part of the time, rode for a paycheck part of the time. Uh, I was also training horses. I had a background at training reined cow horses and uh, um, showed all kinds of horses to make a living. Uh, but the cow horse was my, my first love. And I rode a lot of guys' ranch horses because they wanted them to turn around like my horses turned around and uh, have that handle. Um, I, I left the San Joaquin Valley in um, 1984 uh, to go to work for a cutting horse trainer in Santa Inez and worked there for a while until I got a little burned out on that industry. And then I went to, I did a lot of things. I worked in a radio station, wrote ad copy. I worked for a winery as a tasting room manager. I worked for Jedlica Saddlery as a buyer uh, and Western Well, you know, seller, um, fitting people and shaping hats and, uh, um, walked away from that in 1990 and moved to East Tennessee to take a job fox hunting professionally. And wait a minute, uh, fox- so, hold on, hold on, hold on, back, back up, back up, back up, back up. You took a job as a professional fox hunter? Yes. I thought I that's what a- you said. Yeah. Yeah, I was a whipper in, and the whipper in is the person who is on the faster horse and who goes around through the woods and makes the huntsman look good by making sure the hounds are always coming back in toward the huntsman. So there are a couple of smart whips that know where the hounds are going to be, and we're always up there in the woods sending the hounds back towards the huntsman, keeping them from chasing deer and rabbits and uh, keeping things in order. And so and, we, and one could make a living doing this. Yeah, Um uh, you don't make a great living. It's sort of like cowboying for a paycheck. <laughs> uh, but but you're you're sort of looked at like an important person, just like people come to cowboy gatherings. And as you say, they'll spend a lot of money to dress up to look like you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, people would spend a lot of money to dress up and look like me <laughs> when I was hunting professionally. And I did that for a, a while and then decided to come on to um, Nashville, took a couple of horse jobs here and uh, left my guitar kind of tucked away for about a year and a half until I figured that the songs that I was writing, then I was playing in bands in San Inez and Santa Barbara and um, Los Angeles and uh, writing songs and winning all the awards locally in the Santa Barbara Songwriters Guild and winning some down in the Los Angeles Songwriters Guild. And then I got to Nashville and realized that I was here in the heap and the guys that weren't getting cuts were here and the guys that were getting cuts were up here somewhere out of the picture. So uh, I, I buckled down for about a year and a half and figured out how to write and uh, landed a little um, independent publisher, a deal with an independent publisher and we did a song to song basis thing for a long time. Wrote with a lot of nice writers around town, got to know a lot of cool people, and um, secretly I was writing songs about the West 
not cowboy songs, but songs about the people of the American West. One night at a writer's show in Nashville, a guy named Boomer Castleman, who used to be in a group called the Lewis and Clark Expedition with his ex-songwriting partner, Michael Martin Murphy, was on this show with me, and he leaned around after I sang, I think it was Red Velvet Slippers, and he said, do you have any more like that? And I said, a whole lot. (laughs) That that set me on a, a thing, and I realized, oh, there is an audience for this kind of music. So I, I did a, a demo album, pitched it around, and nobody was really very interested in it. But I got some funding and did a whole album, pitched it to a Western label in Nashville, the only Western label, not knowing it was going under at that time. Uh, but a friend of mine suggested, why don't you pitch it to Rounder Records? And I pitched it to Rounder Records, and they said, we love this. Uh, we we would love to do something with this now. How much are you touring? <laughs> <laughs> and I gave the naive answer. Oh well, I'm ready to go. <laughs> they wanted me to be touring X number of dates a year in order to. So um, I waited about another year and released it on my own. Couple years time uh, went out on the road full time. Yes, you did. I remember that quite well. <laughs> I remember that quite well. And that was uh, that would have been Tumbleweed Letters, I believe. Is that the it was name Tumbleweed of Tumbleweed Letters? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had a duet with Ranger Doug yes, from did. Writers in the Sky yeah. on that, and he was very gracious. Came in and did the duet with me, and and I didn't do cowboy songs because there weren't cowboy songs that I had ever heard that were really for women. There were songs for cowboys to sing, and there were songs for women to sing about Moni wishing the cowboy would come home, written by women who had obviously never been married to a cowboy or a team roper and not known where the grocery money went. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, I set out to write some songs, not, not as a militant thing, that, oh, we need women's songs. I set out to write some songs that were convincing for me to sing, and being a folk artist, a folk singer at heart, I wrote folk songs that were about Western things. And well, that, it worked. That, that brings me to my question, my next question, which would be, can we talk a little bit about your influences? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I grew up on Joan Baez. Um, I, I grew up listening to her play guitar. I learned little guitar licks listening to her records. Uh, We had one record. I was 10 years old and my cousin had the record actually. And so we recorded it on a reel to reel. And I listened to that endlessly, had the Joan Baez songbook, learned the songs. And I loved story songs. I, I loved the songs that told usually tragic stories. And I loved listening to shows, watching shows like Hoot Nanny, Growing up, those great folk music shows. Hullabaloo. (laughs) Yes, and they were full of these wonderful story songs, and I was was hooked on them. And so that's what I wanted to write. I had no interest in cute songs um, or cowgirl songs that just had nothing for me. What I wanted to do was tell the stories of some of the people of the West, uh, whether they were fictitious or part of some of them real or some of them a collaboration of different stories I'd heard. So that's where the influences came from. I listened to Doc Watson. I listened to the Weavers. um, All of those people, I, I, uh, I listened to those records endlessly. Well, you're you're such a fabulous storyteller on stage, not only musically, but uh, uh, the setups for your songs and everything like that. So that the storytelling aspect comes through very, very, very strong. Um, as a matter of fact, I think um, that's that's probably much of your appeal is the fact that you are so story based. Now, can you talk a little bit about that? The appeal that that should have for audiences. Well, I I really. Um got to loving that from listening to Mickey Newberry record, live records from Mickey Newberry with him telling the stories behind songs like Booger Red's Blues. And, um, uh, and I, and I played a lot of Nashville songwriter shows, lots and lots of them. Sometimes I'd play two or three a night. 
three or four nights a week. We'd all be out running from one show to the next. Um, and to hear some of those writers tell the setup about how this song came to be, that to me was a fascinating part. Bonanza came on Sunday nights, right after Disney. We Fisher kids had to go to bed right after Disney. Bonanza came on at 8.30, remember? We had to go to bed, but that Bonanza music would come under our bedroom door. And it would lure us out. It would tell us that if we hid behind the couch, we could peek out over the top and watch Bonanza. Why aren't there any women on Bonanza? Three young guys and their dad seems a little strange. I was real little and I figured out there was something wrong at the Ponderosa. I can say this now because they're all dead. Little Joe was a wimp. Yeah, he was cute. Anybody ever seen a cowboy wear a green corduroy jacket? Show of hands? No. Ride a paint horse? No. Wear a little hat on the back of his head so his little pompadour bangs would show? No. Little Joe would ride into town, puff up his little chest in the wrong place, and every third episode, Little Joe gets shot. It's always just a flesh wound. Nobody ever just took a look at that hat and said, that's it, and shot him through the heart. No. <laughs> have to wing him. It's just a flesh wound, Paul. They'd have to wrap him up, mop his little forehead. Paul would have to sit on his bed, feed him soup. There weren't people in our family that looked like Hoss. I couldn't figure that out. I have a question. Whose kids were those? <laughs> they, they didn't match anybody. Somebody said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. Uh, they're, they're all uh, Pa Cartwright's kids, all Ben Cartwright's kids. They had different mothers. Their mothers all died. And we could tell that Haas's mother died in childbirth. Adam just gave me the creeps. <laughs> when we were growing up, my mom had a little black poodle. His name was Peppy, and I was pretty sure they'd come in at night and clipped hair off Peppy and glued it on Adam. But Hop Singh was the coolest guy on the show. He always saved the day. Little Joe had ridden off to town again, puffed up his chest and gotten shot. He's up in his room, it's just a flesh wound, Paul. They could never find Haas when there's trouble. He was off at the buffet in Carson City. Adam had sailed off to Spain after some woman he said he was in love with, and we knew if he brought her back to the Ponderosa, she'd be dead by 8.53. But Hop Singh would ring that dinner bell. ding a ding a ding dinner ready. And everything would be good. And Hop Singh held the place together, and he deserves a song but not tonight. Do you, um, do you think you could uh, maybe give us a song here? Uh, I, I'll sing a little uh, snippet. I don't even have my guitar out. I haven't played it in two months, but I'll sing a little snippet from something that, that's cool to me um, because it, it, it led to a song. And I first heard a cool recording of Railroad Corral that Don Edwards had recorded. And, and I went, wait a minute, I know that song. And it's farewell to Tawafi, a do Mormon hill, and the dear land of Kremen, I bid you farewell. I am bound off for Greenland and ready to sail in hopes to find riches in hunting whale. We're up in the morning at the breaking of day. Chuck wagons busy, there's flapjacks at play. The herd is astir over hillside and dale, and the night riders round and then up on the trail. I love that that when I my brain clicked in and went, that's the same song. That to me is 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 the beauty of history in in songs, and then we can move on to 
Uh, farewell, Angelina. The bells of the crown are being stolen by bandits. I must follow the sun. The triangle tingles and the trumpets play slow. Bob Dylan. So those are the things that to me are the fascinating history of, of what I call Western music. Well, um, thank you so very much for your time. It was good to see you. Thank you. So good to see you, Dave. Have a great time. Oh, well, I'll try. Zeros by their name. They'd all be drawing zeros by their name. Well, I'm the kid from Colfax at Itter. He swapped his wife's gold tooth to get the dough. And he looked like hair and bail and wire and splitters when they got him on the bronc and let him go. He could ride, oh, he could ride. That day spurred the devil right out of that horse's hide. Oh, he could ride, oh, he could ride, ride, ride. By God, that Yakima could ride. Rex Allen, he was the last of the Silver Spring Cowboys. The last of the Silver Spring Cowboys. The last of a fast dying breed. The cattle are grazing and six guns are blazing. More heroes, that's what America really needs. The last of the silver screen cowboys standing tall for what he believed was right. Don't push it. Cause more than one villain's found That he wouldn't back down from a fight Roy and Trigger, we love you And Hoppy, we saved up our dimes For the Saturday sat through both movies two times. Gene Lash and Rex were our heroes. We knew they would win in the end. If we could just turn back the pages. Again. Okay, and here we have another one of my heroes, uh, a, a guy that I've known for, for several, several years and a member of the Western Music Hall of Fame, uh, my friend, Mr. Rex Allen Jr. Hello, Rex. Hey, Dave. How are you, man? Better than I deserve, probably. Well, now, you are one of the uh, bravest men in Western music that I can think of in that you were the guy who bucked the norm in Nashville and insisted on keeping Western in country music. Right. Um, yes, you were. Now, how big a pushback did you get on that? Well, I, 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 
my concept with that was is that and I, the argument with the record company and, the, and the, really the first major label deal I had was with Warner Brothers back in the 70s and my pushback with them was is that I said okay we're doing an album here I said just at least give me one cut and they said well why do you want to do western music and I said well because it's my heritage you wouldn't ask you know you it'd be like saying to Hank Jr. he can't go on stage and do Collagen <laughs> well you know it, it, and it's, it, that's true and absolutely uh, you know, I, I, if you want me, if you get me, you get you get the heritage. You know, yeah, I grew up with Hank Williams. Yeah, I knew who all those people were. But uh, you know, my heroes as a boy were Bob Nolan and Tim Spencer and the Sons of the Pioneers, and you know, the, the, the Tex Williams and all those people that I grew up with. When I first got to Nashville, Dave, I had to go and and go to the Grand Ole Opry and literally learn about the history of country music but when it came to doing it on albums they they would they would let me get away with it so i would i would go ahead and do songs but now i'll tell you a story and and it has to do with a song well it's the as far as i know it's the second to the last uh cowboy song that was on the major major charts on the billboard charts and I'd written a song called Can You Hear Those Pioneers. Oh, yeah. And I, I took it to my producer, who was Larry Brett Butler, and he said, we're not going to do that song. And I said, Larry, it's a hit. It's about me and my heritage and my identity and everything else. And he said, we're not going to do it. And so I went, I cut it on one of the old Air Force shows that we used to do, Army and Air Force and Marine shows, that, the AFARC shows. And they did a beautiful job. Finally, I convinced Larry Butler to let me do it. And he cut it Western Swing. And, be, and he didn't understand that there was a difference between Western music and Western Swing. That's wow. like saying, do you, do you know anything about Christian music? No, and they don't know anything about Western music or country music. Right. And so it just it crushed me. And so another six months go by, and I convinced him to let me do it again. And he cut it, he listened to me more and got the rhythm right. But he cut it so slow that it was almost a waltz. So he made a 24-track copy. I called Warner Brothers and I said, I'm coming to L.A. And we're going to work on a record. And so I went into the studio in Los Angeles. And then I got to do the right things. I put, I put the Sons of the Pioneers doing background vocals on it. Uh, I couldn't get all of them because, you know, remember the Pioneers in those days. They were scattered all over the yeah. United States. So I got Lloyd Perryman and Rusty Richards. Mm -hmm, sure. And then so and the guy singing that, that sang the third part for the Pioneers was was Dad. Dad sang on the record. And actually Dad does the yodel at the end. Then I get it done, I take it back to Larry Butler. And Larry Butler says, I don't we're not releasing that. We're gonna release this song that I wrote. And I said, You're good. So anyway, I'm the only guy that ever fired Larry Butler. And Larry Butler <laughs> The, was the was the only producer in Nashville that had ever won the Pop Producer Award coming out of here, and he won it on Kenny Rogers. Dis, uh, disappointed again. Anyway, he he said we're releasing this single, and I said, well, your job hangs on it. And he released a song, and it only went to like twenty five on the charts, and I fired him. Then, so I'm talking to Warner Brothers and trying to get them to convince, and I was doing a show here they gave me one song to do on the old at the old disc jockey convention mm -hmm. when they had the jocks in town and that sort yep. of stuff and so uh, i had my band andy wickham who was president of warner brothers country he said okay rex now you're going to do this song with the band right and i said yeah some other tune and i he laughed and i looked at my band and i said we're doing can you hear those pioneers and my 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 uh, road manager, he said, Rex, he said, the Warner Brothers wants you to do the other one. I said, I don't care what they want. I said, we're doing Can You Hear Those Pioneers. So I went out on stage and did Can You Hear Those Pioneers for the for 300 disc jockeys. They were cheering. I had a standing ovation. And uh, Mike Oatman, you know, you remember Mike. I do. From K, uh, KFDI in Wichita. Mike Oatman walked up after the show and he said, Rex, he said, that's, that's your record. He said, you've got, you've got to release that. And Andy Wickham was standing there. 
And I said, well, uh, the president of Warner Country says no. And <laughs> Oldman said, if you don't release that record on Rex Allen Jr., he owns 17 radio stations. Off for, he can't went from the Canadian border all yep. the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. He literally blanketed the Midwest. And he said, if you don't release that record on Rex Allen Jr., he said, I will never play another Warner Brothers record on any of my stations forever. <laughs> so they, 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 so thanks to Mike Oatman and Camp DI, they forced the record out. And Mike uh, and WHO in Des Moines, uh, they made it. It was a number one country record on all Mike Oatman stations at WHO in Des Moines and that sort of stuff. The big, big stations in the Midwest for 18 weeks. And Mike was the one who really broke the record. But that record, which was out in the um, late 70s, is probably the, the second to the last real country or Western song to, to hit, hit the national charts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Last one was another song I wrote called Ride Cowboy Ride. Oh, yeah. Which you saw. And Ride Cowboy Ride was released in 82 or 84 or something like that. And, and it went to like 30 or 40 on the charts. And that's the last Western song that I know of in, in, in the, quote, traditional Western music vein to actually crack the, the national billboard charts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, it's it's really interesting, Dave, if, if you really want to get into it, because it's really cool. You know, it, 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 I, I, I have a radio show that I do on internet radio, on truckersradiousa.com, and, and we, we, play, we play you, and, uh, well, thank but you. We, play, we play traditional country and Western music. We play music prior to 19, from 85 all the way to 1930. And... Uh, when I, I do the shows, I try to, you know, do Western music and do country music and so on and so forth. But we're dealing with the art form of country music. And the art form of country music is the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And then there was a change. And now a lot of people don't like modern country music, and that's okay. But it, the art form changes. And, and because people change. And the same thing should apply to Western music. And that's my biggest problem with Western music. <laughs> is, a, is, the, is the art form. The, I understand the art form of, of Western music, which is basically the 30s and 40s and into the 50s, up to 1959. And that's, you know, 57, 56. Doug could tell you, Green could tell you, the Writers in the Sky, you know, the, Exact date of the last Pioneers album. I, I'm not that kind of guy, but mm. you know, mid '50s somewhere. And, uh, and then, then of course, then there's the Marty Robbins album in 1959, right. Cal- the Gunfighter Ballads, which is was a smash album. The Pink, the Pink album, yeah, absolutely. The Pink album. It. I mean, that's and that's still one of the biggest selling records at MCA. Had. But the art form of Western music which is basically, you know, the singing cowboy era of the 30s and 40s and into the 50s with my dad. It, 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 you can't try to weld Western music into one particular art form. The art form grows. That'd be like saying to rock and roll music that you all have to play music that was recorded like it was in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, it can't happen. You know, the, the technology changes and we all learn how to do things better. And and so music grows. And my problem with uh, the IWMA, and it's not really a problem, it's just an opinion. And we all got a mouth so we can have an opinion. But my opinion is is that we need to broaden broaden the, the genre of Western music. There's It's okay to have traditional Western music over here. There's no problem with that. If, if you want to sing like the Sons of the Pioneers or the Sons of the San Joaquin, I don't have any problem with that. But don't don't throw away the mm. new guy coming up. Right, Just exactly right. He doesn't sing exactly like that. that that's my problem. I, I think that in order for Western music to have a future, I think I've been arguing, you know, I've been chairman of the advisory board for years, 
and they're finally getting rid of it, getting rid of that title. <laughs> Which is great with me. That's just fine. Because I've been trying to resign for years. I said, no, 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 we're just going to get rid of it. I said, that's fine. My opinion, in my opinion, 50% of the stuff that Garth Brooks did is cowboy music. It absolutely is. Yeah. Love if, it. You, yeah. if it's how you define it and how you think about it, but you know, to me, Beaches of Cheyenne is a new cowboy song. It is, absolutely it is. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And all the dreams that they've been living in that California sand died right there beside him in Cheyenne. There's no doubt about it. Subject and, matter and, and delivery, it's all Western music. It, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the Sons of the Pioneers. That's okay. No. There's nothing wrong with that art form. No. And it is an art form. But that doesn't mean that we can't change and grow. And 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 I said to him at the WMA convention a few years ago, I said, you know, you should have should have given Garth Brooks the award for Entertainer of the Year. Sure. They said, well, why? I said, because he's doing Western music. Oh, no, no, no. He's a country <laughs> act. No, no, no. He's a cowboy act that crossed into the into the country field. And the big Just time. much like I did. Yeah. You know, I, right. I never had any hits doing Western music. I did my hits were in doing country, but that didn't mean that didn't stop me from doing Western music. Obviously, your biggest influence would have been your dad. I I would sure. think. However, um, did he did he steer you at all, or did you just kind of develop it by osmosis, or did he actually caution you away from it? No, he. He, not, not at all. He didn't caution me away from it at all. When I was growing up, if my parents had a party at the house, it was nothing, nothing I, to have. I'd have Bob Nolan sitting at the end of the couch, Slim Pickens sitting in the middle, and Merle Travis sitting on the end, and Tex Williams over on the corner, and this guy over, you know, some of these people like this, passing a guitar. I mean, the first time I heard Strawberry Roan, was Slim Pickens doing it. And I can't repeat it now. Tonight, folks, I'd like to sing a real old timer. It's called Strawberry Roan. Let me tell you a tale and a good one I own Of a bucking old bronco, a strawberry roan I was hanging around town, not earning a dime Out of a job, just spending my time When a stranger steps up and he says, I suppose You're a bronc busting man from the looks of your clothes So I says, guess you're right, there's none I can't tame If it's riding wild ponies, that's my middle name Oh, that strawberry roan, oh, that strawberry roan, I'll ride him until he lies down with a groan, there's nary a bronco I couldn't bring home, bring on your strawberry roan, oh, that strawberry roan, oh, that strawberry roan, he went toward the east and came down toward the west, to stay in his middle, I'm doing my best on that strawberry roan. Now there is no fool in this pony can step, but I'm still setting tight and I'm earning the rep. I lost both my stirrups and off went my hat, grabbing for the saddle horn blind as a bat. And he makes one more jump and he's headed up high, leaves me a satin on nothing in the sky. Turned over twice, then I came back to earth And I starts into hating the day of his birth Oh, that strawberry roam Oh, that strawberry roam That sunfish and critter's worth leaving alone There's nary a buster from Texas to Nome Could ride that strawberry roam did that influence me in any way? No. Did he did he try to t turn me in a direction? Not really. He he wanted me to be creative, and he liked the things that I was doing. Now, when I was a kid growing up in L.A., you know, in in the '60s, early '60s, there wasn't any place for a kid to sing Western music in Los Angeles in those days. We sang folk music. Yeah. And and. Then we became a rock and roll band when the Beatles came in and killed folk music overnight. 
and all we did is the same songs, but we did them with guitars and drums. We did the same damn songs. We didn't change the song. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that even in, even the the funny thing about that time period of for me back in the '60s, and my dad was watching all of it go on, was we were still doing. I was still doing Ghost Riders in the Sky. Now I didn't care if I, we were doing a folk group or if I was doing my little high school rock and roll band. We were still doing Ghost Riders in the Sky. And we were doing the Stan John tunes, and we were doing we were doing Cash. Mm -hmm. you know, was it was cut? And Johnny Cash is a member of the Western Music Hall of Fame. It should be all the songs that he wrote and did that were Western oriented. Yeah, he did a There's bunch no of them. about it. But the only thing, the only, the only real, <laughs> the only real problem I had with my dad is he hated the Beatles. <laughs> hated the Beatles. <laughs> He's a nothing but a bunch of long-haired hippie freaks. He says, God bless him. He says, I don't like him at all. And so I sat down with him one day. I said, Dad, I got some songs that I want you to hear. And he said, I said, okay. He said, okay. I said, there are places I remember all my life. Though some have changed, some forever, not for better. Some have gone and some remain. He says, my God, did you write that? I said, no, that was written by those long-haired hippies that you don't like. That was written by Lennon and McCartney in my life. And so then Dad started branching out. He thought, oh, okay, wait a minute. There's something going on here. And support me. I, I, he, didn't, he didn't try to change what I was doing at all. Uh, I think uh, after he passed away, I learned more about the way he felt about it than, than when he was alive. But after he passed away, people would say to me, they'd say, they'd say Rex, do you know how, how proud your dad was of what you've done? And I said, no, he never told me. <laughs> and that's, that's why to this day, Dave, my kids and grandchildren I tell him every day, if every, time, every chance I get, I'm proud of what you're doing because my yeah. dad told me. But did he try to direct me in a direction? No. He did tell me that uh, back in 71, late 71, he said, he said, son, I was trying to do the acting thing in L.A. And, and do music. I was working the clubs, you know, the same ones that Tex Williams was working and the same ones Jimmy Wakely was working mm -hmm. and all yeah, we were all working all those clubs, like the Palomino, and and I, you know, I worked the Palomino every six weeks for a year. Uh, but uh, he he looked at me and he said he said you need to give up the acting thing and focus on the music. He says your future is in the music. If you want to go back into acting later, you can't. But you need to do the music. And he said, and by the way, you don't need to be here. You need to get out of L.A. and go move to Nashville. To do it. And so that's why I came to Nashville. And and you ended up with how many top tens did you have in your oh, career? I don't know. I, it's easier for me. I, I have a new album out called Then and Now. And uh, it's on uh, Country Rewind Records. And it's, uh, I, I, you know, believe it or not, I've got a record in the, that's number four this week called Dream on Texas Ladies on the, on the, the independent country music chart. Um, it, when they did the research on, on me at the record label, they said, Rex, do you realize that you've had 60 top 50 records on the Billboard charts in your career? And I had no idea, Dave. I just said, holy God. I, 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 and I didn't. And, I, and, and now that we all have, you know, Spotify or you've got Alexa to play, play your music, mm -hmm. you know, I said, play Rex Allen Jr. And he'll play a song and I, I'll listen to it and say, damn. I'd forgotten I even wrote that song, and 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 I'll Google it, and they'd say, oh, "Well, it went to number twelve on the Billboard chart." <laughs> well, maybe I ought to put it back in the show. You might want to put that. You might want to start doing it again. Crack it up. Yeah, start doing exactly. that one again. Well, do you have a? Um, have you got one you can play for us now? Well, I uh, hell yeah, I can play anything you want. What do you want? I don't know. Play, play your play your 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 new hit. Well, let me do let me do this song for you. I. I this is the first music video I had out, and I, I released this song 
internationally. And uh, it went top five in Australia, New Zealand, and in uh, all over Europe in uh, 2016. Cowboys now blows on big movie screens. Good guys and bad guys and horses with names. Gone not forgotten, just rode out of town. And all are part of my memories now. Saturday mornings, the posse would meet. With cap guns and bicycles out in the streets We'd all dress like cowboys and go get in line To cheer for our heroes just one more time Where are the heroes for my boys? today who make the memories for him when he's gray will he never ride on the rhymes like I did will he never know what it means to have heroes Stops and coupons I'd send so far away For an autographed picture That I still have today And I'll never forget the day That he came to town And I got to follow my hero around where are the heroes for my boy today? Who made the memories for him when he's gray? Will he never ride on the reins like I did? Will he never know what it means? To have heroes To have heroes Well, I think, I think we've used you up here. Uh, I appreciate the time spent and I appreciate the stories. It's always a delight. Oh, it's, it's, it's great to see you, man. I look forward to it. And then maybe I'll see you in November at the WMA if you're going. That's our show, folks. Hope you were singing around the campfire with us as we rebooted the 50s and corralled all the cowboys. There's a lot more great Roots music out there we haven't visited yet, so watch for our upcoming specials. The Viva Las Vegas Rockabilly Weekender, and another show we call the Ranch Party Roundup. Don't forget to take care of our performers today via the old tip jar at stellarjacks.com. They need it badly as they navigate through the lonesome prairie of the pandemic. They thank you for your generosity. <laughs>